Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for dialing into our frequency here. And you picked a good frequency to dial into, especially if you're into weird shit. And who are we kidding? We're all into weird shit around these parts. And so, too, is Eric Davis. He's back in the house for a second time to rap a bit about his latest book, High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. Most of you know Eric from his podcast, Expanding Mind, or from the tome known as Technosis, or perhaps from his work on the exegesis of Philip K. Dick. No matter how you know him, you know he is the sultan of high strangeness and high weirdness. His book may just be his magnum opus, which is saying quite a bit if you've read his previous work. High weirdness charts the emergence of a new psychedelic spirituality that arose from American countercultural voices of the 1970s, including Philip K. Dick, Terrence McKenna, and Robert Anton Wilson. And these three authors changed the way millions of readers thought dreamed and experienced reality, but how do their writings reflect as well as shape the seismic cultural shifts taking place in America at that time? Well, let's dig a bit into that with the technostic himself, Mr. Eric Davis. Enjoy. Eric Davis, welcome back to the show. Always nice to hear your voice. Looking forward to some more mind expansion here. Excellent. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is. Uh, You have a book out now called High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. And man, what a tome this is. It is jam-packed with this, I don't know, like this weird chocolatey goodness, which means we have plenty to talk about. And I think the best place to start is with the why. You know, why does this book now exist, Eric, as a physical entity? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I'd have to start the tale. It's It's a bit of a longer tale, but why not? Back when I first was introduced to uh, the work of Philip K. Dick, I, it was in the late 1980s, so it wasn't long after Dick died at a point when he, the sort of nadir of his fame, you know, a lot of his books were out of print, and it was kind of a cult author, and somebody turned me on to his work, and it just kind of like blew my mind, you know, it was, it was uh, a voice from beyond, and I did uh, my senior thesis as an undergraduate at Yale on Phil Dick. And at that point, there was, you know, a a very modest amount of critical literature. I mean, critics had been interested in Dick more than most science fiction writers, especially of his generation. But still, compared to today, it was a pretty small potatoes. So it was, uh, you know, it was an interesting thing to work on. And I was mixing it with postmodern theory and ideas about society of the simulation, particularly from Jean Baudrillard, who was a kind of trendy 80s French philosopher who, you know, in many ways is more often was kind of lumped in with post-structuralists or post-moderns, which is true to a degree, but he always had more directly to say to people interested in technology in the future and virtual reality and the kind of Gnostic dimension of technology, even though he was by no means a Gnostic, he was much more of a Marxist, but he, his a- analysis was kind of disturbingly science fictional and dystopian. So kind of like a cyberpunk philosopher. Anyway, so I wrote this text, but I never really felt like I had kind of done PKD right. When I was a, became a freelance writer after college, I was, you know, part of the sort of world that helped make him more famous. You know, in the, in the early 1990s, again, there wasn't that much stuff. His books weren't in print. And, you know, there were a number of different people working in different domains who were kind of keeping his name alive or even trumpeting his name. You know, Jonathan Lethem was a great example of someone well-known who was doing that. PKD Society was cranking out the, their critical interests. And I was writing journalism. So I wrote a number of pieces about Dick for Slick Magazines and the Village Voice and stuff like that. I really wanted to put his name forward. And I was also interested in showing how his work really speaks to a lot of technological issues, a lot of the, the crossover between the unconscious and technology and speculative fiction and paranoia. And that, you know, it was really important to think of him in these, in this context. And I was doing a lot of work on media theory, the kind of stuff that would lead to technosis. And of course there was a section on, on Dick in technosis that, you know, talks about two, three seventy four and 
So I'd been kind of like writing about Dick throughout my life, but I never really like did it. And uh, since I got, I had the great opportunity of working on the exegesis or, you know, the published version of the exegesis that was edited by Pamela Jackson and, and Jonathan Lethem. And I worked very closely with Pamela and, you know, I got a credit as the annotations editor, which is something I did, but I did a lot to help her out as well. And, you know, I read through the whole book a couple of times and was really like down in the, in the trenches with this very peculiar, powerful, wonderful, disturbing, boring text, mega text, meta text of the exegesis. So when I went to, uh, to get a PhD, I finally decided to get a PhD. It was something I always wanted to do, kind of more for me than for wanting to be an academic, although I, you know, I do admire scholarship and, and hope to teach. Uh, it wasn't like I was just making a, a careerist move. And I was, it was so obvious that was going to be my, my topic. I was just going to write about the exegesis, 2374, the exegesis. Here we go. Bang. I'll, I mean, I'm first one out of the gate, well-timed. People are interested in Dick. So there I was like, and you know, when you go to grad school, like one of the things that people talk about is what their project is. And people are always changing their minds. You know, they're like really confident. They're in, get into something. It's like, I'm going to write about the, the, you know, the figure of the animal in 1950s science fiction. And they're like totally into it. And then like two weeks later, they're, you know, they're, they're writing about nature mysticism in young adult fiction or something. You know, you're <laughs> like, what? How did this happen? But I always knew it was PKD exegesis 2374, PKD exegesis 2374. And I even have my whole PhD outline, like the chapter breakdowns, what we were going to do in each one. And then there was just this moment where I was looking at like this whole thing. And I was like, I was like, man, I can't do this. I don't want to spend three years in Philip K. Dick's head. I'll go crazy. <laughs> so like at <laughs> yeah. the last minute, I was like, I, I don't want, I, this is too much. It's too much. Just do it on PKD. And as soon as I got that out of the way, though, it was really obvious what the project was. It was like a instantaneous, not, a, not like an insight, but just like once I got that out of the way, it was just the, the, the reconstituted enthusiasm was very clear where, you know, as I'd been doing this work on Dick, I was, I, of course, sort of noticed that there were these interesting resonances and connections between his experience and other experiences that occurred around the same time. You know, Robert Anton Wilson was a writer I discovered about the same time as I discovered Phil Dick. And I read the Illuminatus and Cosmic Trigger, which talks about, a, you know, not dissimilar, let's just say not dissimilar kind of experience brought on by a lot of uh, magic and LSD and uh, weird thinking. It also in California, you know, in 1974 and uh, 1973, 1974. And there was Terrence McKenna, again, you know, somewhat similar kind of experience. McKenna had written about Phil Dick's experience saying, yeah, that's what happened to me. So it was like, whoa, what's that about? And then there's others too that I didn't end up really focusing on in the book, but I, but I mentioned stuff, John Lilly, Timothy Leary, and some more kind of obscure new age uh, experiences and ideas. And the thing that was similar about these, these experiences, because there were some real significant differences too, including the role of psychedelics, like, you know, obviously McKenna and, and Ra are totally psychedelic and Dick is not by this point in his life. He's not taking psychedelics. You know, he might have done one. It appears that he did one like DOM slash STP trip sometime in the early 70s. But basically, he wasn't he was never very into psychedelics. So obviously, there's some significant differences. But in other ways, just real similarities. There's like it's like a sense that there's it's kind of like religious experience, but not. There are elements of science fiction, of paranoia, of aliens of kind of uh, a, a sort of self-awareness about the process itself. Like it wasn't just some, oh, I got the revelation. Now I know the truth. It was some kind of, there was a, an element of, of skepticism and criticism within the unfolding of the experience that was often very funny. Synchronicities played a role and a sort of tawdry, tacky quality, like a kind of pop culture, gutter, trash dimension. To the thing. It wasn't just some like awesome sacred. It was something that was also kind of weird and, and a little dark even. So as soon as I was like, what am I going to write about? It was like, bam, what you're going to write about is multiple experiences and try to suggest what connects them and 
To do that, I'll have to really pay attention to one of my favorite periods in American history, probably my, my single favorite period in American history, the early 1970s, which is something that even aside from these guys, I've always been fascinated, or at least since college, when a bunch of my friends and I put out a zine devoted to the 70s and, you know, we had fashion, music. Uh, it's still, to my mind, you know, just one of the richest cultural periods in, in the 20th century. And also really important as somebody like me who's really interested in the counterculture that, you know, so much of the discourse of the mythology of the stories we tell ourselves about the meaning of the, the counterculture, the post-war Euro, you know, American mostly, but, you know, Euro-American developed world, but, you know, it goes across the world. But the stories we tell about the counterculture are really about the 60s, free speech movement, Hate Street, March on the Pentagon, Kent State, Altamont, Woodstock, Charlie Manson. And now we're getting right into like 1970. And then it kind of stops. We're not really sure what happens there. But of course, what's actually happening is that a lot of these strange practices and new ideas and, and weird explorations that were relatively constrained in the 60s spread into mass culture in the 1970s. And then there's a, a lot of different changes in society that are happening, you know, economic changes. But behind it is this enormous deflation of the revolutionary dreams, the utopian dreams of the 60s generations. Because whether you were a hippie and you expected some mass consciousness transformation that everybody's going to like tune into the cosmic yow and, and we're all going to, you know, groove our way into some organic communal future, or you were a radical and you were, you know, aimed directly against modern capitalism and military industrial complex, and you thought there was going to be a revolution. But both of these views and the mixes of these two views were very much presaged on this idea of radical transformation. And that's one of the things when you talk to people who are, who can remember something from the, from the late sixties is like a lot of them will, in my experience, say the hardest thing to communicate about this period to other people is the profound, powerful, almost unquestioned sense that this radical transformation was right on the horizon. But then it doesn't happen. Well, what happens after that? The early 70s. That's what the early 70s is. It's this drift through malaise and reinvention and multiplicity. It's no longer about the coming together with like one great movement, you know, the, the big marches dissolve into lots of little fragmented political identities. We get the rise of kind of early identity politics with different kind of multicultural perspectives. So it becomes very pluralistic and it also becomes more religious, culty, a sectarian. You have this rise of new religious movements and gurus and the occult revival, people are interested in magic and astrology. And then there's this sort of new phenomena of kind of therapy cults where they're secular and psychological, but they still have this quality of like intensity and transformation, you know, groups like Est or, or Synanon. And all of this stuff just gets really intense throughout the 70s, but particularly in the early 70s. So part of what I wanted to do in telling the stories of these gentlemen and putting them into their proper historical context was to give voice to this side or this way of looking at the early 70s, which in a lot of ways resonates with our own time more than most periods, almost in any period in American history, in the sense of a, a dominant sense of like fatigue, anxiety, fear. There's fears of terrorism. There's fears of surveillance. There's a sense of economic ricketiness, uh, uh, possibilities of war. There's malfeasance in the White House. You know, Watergate is this almost mythic event in the early 70s imagination where the, you know, the, the sovereign is revealed to be this kind of monster, this weird character. And now we, you know, things are very, are different in terms of the politics of it, but in other ways, it can feel kind of similar. So I really wanted to honor the early 70s in this book as well. So once all those things came together, it was very clear what was going on with this project and that it was a really good time to bring it out because there's a lot of interest around psychedelics right now. But a lot of that interest is emphasizing the kind of healing and medicinal aspects. There's this mainstreaming of psychedelics going on as places like the New York Times and the New Yorker embrace it. And 
you know, think positively about how this could actually help people. But in order for that narrative to, to get gain traction and in order for new social actors like doctors and therapists and pharmaceutical companies and legislators, in order for these people to get on board, everybody has to repress the countercultural story. You have to demonize Timothy Leary. You have to say that all those freaks were doing it wrong and that now that science is back in the picture, we can trust that now we can do it right. And I also just wanted to, you know, put a whatever, just a big foot in that that attempt to rewrite history because I just don't think that's accurate. And I also think it's very important to remember that whatever else psychedelics are, healing, revealing, insightful, sacred, uh, nurturing, blah, 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 whatever else they are, they're also totally fucking weird. And that if we <laughs> yeah. ignore that, if we don't look at that, we're missing something really profound that then gets into this whole question of what the weird is and how we both acknowledge and repress the weird. But I've been branching on a little bit here. So that's why this book exists now. And I think it's really well-timed and it's, it's going to sort of strike a set of notes that I, I hope reverberate through a lot of conversations these days. Yeah, I think they will. And you actually segued rather nicely into my next question. And it was about that word weird. You know, it has an interesting, I guess, etymology, and we use it in such interesting ways. You know, we describe things as weird without really knowing or understanding what we're trying to communicate with that word. And I'm curious, like, what you learned about that word in, like, an historical cultural context as it relates to both how we used it back in the 70s, how we use it now, and how we understand it in general. Yeah, I mean, this this continues to be a, a really fascinating, you know, thing that I've been looking at. I continue to look at because when I was putting all this stuff together, okay, we have the 70s, we have, okay, we have these experiences. I was wrestling around this this problem that I kind of alluded to before, which is that in some ways, and I and I I should mention that I got my degree in religious studies. So I was very familiar with having studied a lot of the literature, not only about the history of the occult and the history of esotericism in America and Europe, but particularly in the 20th century. Within that literature, there's a, a lot of writing and a lot of wrangling and arguments and fearsome arguments about the nature of either religious experience or mystical experience. There's a huge, huge literature on this stuff. So this is where I was kind of coming from because I look at these guys and I go, well, in some ways, these experiences are kind of classic religious or mystical experiences. But in other ways, they're not. And in fact, part of what makes them interesting is the ways that they're not. They're something else. We could say they're psychedelic or pathological or mediated by pop culture or by technology or science fiction or the occult revival, which is, you know, kind of religious, but also sort of a slightly different character than what most people mean by it. And, I, you know, for me, it was really important to, to honor that difference. So then I was kind of stuck. Well, what is it? What's, what's the vibe? It's not religious. It's not the sacred. It may be a, a curious combination of the sacred and the profane, which I do talk about some in the book, but still wasn't quite right. I wanted a vibe. What was it? And I don't really remember when I, when I hit on the, the title, which I, I stole directly from the Church of Subgenius Reverend Ivan Stang, who wrote a marvelous book called High Weirdness by Mail that came out in the late 1980s. Very important book for me. I think it's the late 80s. It really turned me on to weird American religious and a, and a whole culture, a whole way of thinking about weird religion and weird experiences and subcultures and stuff. Brilliant book. So I, but I was like, oh, that's it. And it was just the phrase. I wasn't really thinking about the weird yet. I was just thinking like, oh yeah, high weirdness. What does that mean? You know, well, high, well, this high means getting high or taking drugs or being up in the heavens. So it's kind of religious, but also kind of like drugs and da, da, da. And then, and then I was like, weirdness. And I, was like, I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a weird word. Or as I, I, I say in the book, a wayward word. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of caught me. And I was like, oh, what, what, this is an interesting word because one of the things that I, I started to do as I got interested in the weird is notice where it comes up, not just in literature, which is kind of the obvious place to start, or pop culture, but also specifically in people's speech, like ordinary people's speech. Like people use the term 
all the time, all the time. You start listening, you hear this conversation, go ahead, spend a week tuning into when and where you and other people use the word weird. And one of the things that's interesting about that usage is as you asked in your question, it's often kind of a throwaway word. It's not like we're claiming anything by saying something's weird. We're kind of like, in fact, the almost the opposite. It's sort of like a wastebasket term. You're sort of sweeping things. You don't really know what else to describe into this basket called weird. But once it's there, you can kind of like not deal with the way that it's unsettling or challenging or disturbing or amazing or enchanted or magical even. You just kind of go, oh, it's out there in the, it's in the weird corner. So then I was like, you know, this is interesting. There's some stuff going on here. And then I, then I tuned into the, the fact that there's like some contemporary theorists that I really admire. People like Tim Morton, who's an ecological thinker. Graham Harmon, who is associated with a contemporary school of, of philosophy called speculative realism. And both of these approaches to thinking are, are very resonant with me. Like I really quite like their work, but both of them also use the word weird in slightly different ways. But they've, they've kind of focused in on it as being a word of action, that there's something here. And within kind of philosophy or thinking or, you know, intellectual life, you can compare it to the, to the uncanny, which if you go to, if you study psychology, if you study literature, if you study horror films, if you study even the, like the history of dolls, you're going to come across this idea of the uncanny. The uncanny is like that thing, it's familiar, but it's not, it's kind of disturbing. It sort of ties in with our psychology. Sigmund Freud wrote a, a famous essay, a great essay, totally worth reading. He talks about synchronicities in this essay, but uh, numerical synchronicities like 23, he doesn't use the number 23, but it's the same idea. And he talks about the uncanny. And of course, he sees it as a, as a reflection of our own inner psychology, our repression, our you know, the ways we we avoid looking at the reality of death and all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of psychologized notion that's perfectly acceptable in academic language. But weird is not. Weird is is almost the opposite. It's unsophisticated. It's crass. It's comic book. It's bubblegum. It's hot rods. It's monster magazines. It's wacky packs. It's weird stuff. Like, it's definitely marginal. But it has, to my mind, an equal amount of degree of claim towards being like an aspect of our, at the very least, our cultural experience. But I think it's even farther. And in this way, it's different than the uncanny. The uncanny ultimately refers to an aesthetic object or to the self, to the to psychology. It's our own psychologies that produce the effect of the uncanny, like the weirdness or the, excuse me, the uncanniness of a doll that's sort of alive and sort of not alive. But weirdness is about the world. Weirdness is a claim about reality, not just the reality of human experience that we experience things that are just weird. And we're sometimes weird people experiencing just weird. I mean, no one ever called anybody like an uncannyish. You know, you don't say that guy's an uncanniest, but you do say that that guy's a weirdo. Like a weirdo is a place, hmm. a deviant place, a place of, 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 the non-norm, of the marginal, of the possibly perverted, of the upside down, of the disturbing, of the fanciful, the kind of, but sort of in a slightly disturbing way, kind of weird way to do it. So it's a, it's a place to be in relationship to society in a way that the uncanny isn't. But it's also something about reality. And this is the final part where I was like, oh yeah, home run, baby. This is a real <laughs> important word and not just like in a superficial way, but it's because it the word lets us link together different things into an insight into reality. It lets us link together social deviancy and weird fiction like Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith and this whole sort of gutter horror tradition of 20th century pop culture. But it also ties in with quantum physics. And you go back to, yes, the 1970s to find not just pop writers, but analytic philosophers, actual real physicists writing about physics who turn towards the term weird or weirdness to describe some of the effects or the consequences or the consequences to our picture of reality that are introduced 
by the facts and the theory of quantum physics or the theories of quantum physics. Well, they say, yeah, if the world is like what quantum physics suggests, which in some ways it is because it works, then there's aspects of the world of reality, of re- the reality that physics speaks to that can only or best be described as just weird. And I'm like, okay, now now we're we're turning to the same term with these set of associations in order to refer to a profound and also somewhat disturbing and discombobulating aspect of reality itself. So all of these dimensions sort of weave together and it's a perfect way of talking about the kinds of crazy psychedelic experiences and visionary experiences in my book, because they it, it combines all of these elements in the sense that it's partly about the history of weird fiction. Lovecraft is an important figure in the stories of all three of the guys that I talk about, and and indeed their writings can all be seen in a way as forms of weird fiction. Illuminatus is kind of a weird fiction. Some of Dick's science fiction is really more like weird fiction. It's almost more, some of it's almost more like horror. I think the three stigmata of Palmer Heldrich is much more of a horror story than it is a science fiction. And at the same time, this weirdness also points to this question of marginality of these guys all being at the edges of acceptable society and taking drugs and thinking, reading, you know, peculiar books and, and sort of trying to make their way through the fringes of a sort of decaying, mutating counterculture through this malaise of the 1970s. But finally, that there's some possibility, and I would like to say a strong possibility, that part of what we're talking about here is not just some crazy guys, or what happens when you take drugs, or what happens when you you go a little psychotic, having read all this crazy stuff. It's not just that, that there's something about reality that's revealed as we study these things that are so elusive. And it's not like a direct thing, like reality is this, or like reality is actually a, a single, you know, web of space-time connection. It's it's not like a speculate like a metaphysical speculation. It's just something about what it means to be in reality, in this experience of multiple dimensions and thought and language and physical objects and time and evolution and the strange matrix that we find ourselves in, there's something about being here and this here that we are in that is fundamentally weird. And so that gave my project a little bit more than a merely cultural con- you know, direction. It wasn't just about cultural objects or cultural experience. There's some sense that what's both concealed and revealed by these wild experiences has something to do with how reality unfolds around us and with us and through us. Mm -hmm. And you use this great phrase in the book, uh, high weirdness is weirdness animated. And as soon as I read that, the first thing I thought of was that scene in uh, the uh, Fear and Loathing film where they're in the hotel room, I think, and they've just taken drugs and the room starts to warp and everything. And it's kind of like what you were saying, like the weird is them taking the drugs, but then the high weirdness, the weirdness animated, is that room starting to distort and what they experience after that. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say, except it's, it's there's one more, uh, I'm going to push it just one more, L, you know, a little bit farther in that direction, which is what I mean by weir- weirdness animated is not just that the, well, it is that the room comes alive, but once you go down that path where normally dead objects or or static objects, non-living objects become alive. And that's something we're all familiar with. The room starts to breathe or patterns start to take on a sort of, you know, fluttering quality like butterfly wings or something. But if we stay or keep going deeper, farther, more intensely in that direction, then not everyone, but many of us will at some point encounter an other another being, another mind. Oh, oh, that pattern staring back at me and oh no, it's got my eyes and oh, it seems like it's wants to talk to me or it's, it's actually looking at me right now. Like that, that twist into what we would call an entity experience is in a way that's the, the essence of the weirdness animated, which is not just that the room becomes alive, but that it becomes peopled, not with human people, but another kind of person, 
another kind of being, another kind of entity. And that was another thing that tied all three of these characters together in very elusive ways. And none of them were very explicit about the forms that, that these others took in their visions or their encounters. All three of them felt that part of their experience was, was an encounter with a kind of either a higher mind or an alien mind, you know, disincarnate intelligence, an angel, a, a sort of machine elf, that there, there was agency in these visionary domains, not just visionary effects, not just the mutating surfaces of phenomena and objects, but agency, aliveness, interaction. And at first, you know, I was doing this, I didn't really want to deal with that. I was like, so complicated. Like, how do you talk about that? It's so crazy. You know, it's just how, I don't know, what do you say? How do you, how do you talk about it and not just pathologize it? You know, you can say, yeah, there have been people encountering, you know, non-human entities throughout history. Obviously, that's true. And not even just the paranormal, just in cultural history and mythology and in anecdotal reports up the wazoo. You know, you can go into the Vatican Library and find thousands and thousands and thousands of strange stories that people told their priests about things they'd seen or whatever. But it's still kind of hard to talk about, especially if, like me, you're trying to take these experiences seriously and not just pathologize them. So that was, in a way, the the most challenging part of the book. And I don't, I don't think I, you know, I didn't solely focus on it. So it's not as thorough as it could be. And there's other discussion of the daemonic. You know, people have talked about this before. It's not like totally groundbreaking or anything, but I, w- I did feel the pressure to, to address not just weirdness, but high weirdness and specifically trace this encounter with another mind or a higher mind through it. Yeah, and I wanted to note your approach to this weirdness, to this material that made it into the book. And I think it's best summed up with a short passage from your introduction. You wrote that when it comes to these extraordinary experiences, you want to, quote, provide maps of their influences, resonances, and structural dynamics rather than unravel their ultimate meaning or origin or cause, end quote. And that seems like a good balance to strike because it it seems like you're not coming at this from just, you know, a serious analytical approach or a full-fledged belief in like what you're writing about, nor are you coming at it from this uber skeptical side either. How hard was it to strike that balance though in the research and the writing? It was hard. It took a, it took an alchemy that I've been participating in on some level or another throughout my life. I mean, I've I've always been drawn towards extraordinary experiences my own, but also others and reading about others and, and drawn towards the, the fringe. I also have a great deal of respect and a kind of, you know, a, a reasonable knowledge of a lot of scientific fields or social scientific fields. And I respect rationality and skepticism a great deal. They're intimate parts of me. You know, Robert Anton Wilson talks about how we all have different selves. And I think this is really true that in some ways we are if not legion, at least we are, uh, you know, a whole gang. Like a, we we have like a a whole Star Trek crew inside of us. And sometimes we're Jordy, and sometimes we're Diana, whatever, you know. Yeah. And and so Wilson talks about these different characters. There's the writer and the lover and the shaman, and one of them is the skeptic. And he says, you know, you got to take your skeptic as seriously as all these other characters. And in fact, you might want to give the, the skeptic something like the the ability to veto other <laughs> other perspectives and and i've uh, you know i read that stuff when i was a young man i read wilson and when i was you know 18 years old and i took that lesson to heart i never left it so there's a part of me that's skeptical a part of me that's really drawn towards extraordinary experiences and then somewhere in between is just a way of taking phenomena seriously without taking it literally and that means that just as an example, if I go into a church, especially by myself, I'm traveling. You know, this happened. I went into the cathedral in, in Exeter in southwest England. And I'm just cruising around. And I, and I open myself up. What's going to happen? What am I going to encounter? What might happen in this space? I don't know. And because it's got the vibe and it's, it's this aesthetic vibe and there's associations with it. I wasn't raised Christian, but I, I have great fondness for a lot of aspects of Christianity and, you know, believe some of it in some weird way. So I'm walking around and then there's this 
Orthodox icon, which is kind of interesting because it's not an Orthodox church, but people like Orthodox icons, you know, Eastern Orthodox icon of Mary. And then suddenly I'm, I'm looking at this beautiful icon and the blue mantle around her head suddenly dissolves into cosmic space, kind of hovering between me and some like deep space field. And I, you know, suddenly feel the sense of, of peace and, and wonder and, and awe feelings I've had before on psychedelics or meditating or in dreams or watching great films. But, you know, these sort of rare aesthetic experiences of, or being in nature. And there I am. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is, ha-, you know, wow, this is great. And, and, you know, I feel this presence or whatever, and it marks me, I've had an encounter, but it doesn't last. And then, then I'm back, you know, outside the church, you know, I'm hungry. Am I going to get fish and chips? And, you know, my feet hurt or whatever. And what do I, what do you do with that? And in my life, I've really honed this kind of weird, uh, unusual way of going through those kinds of experiences where I, I strictly separate them from belief. So I, I fully have that experience. I mean, I have it as much as I can. And it may even call me, you know, is Mary real or do I have a connection with Mother Mary? Which I, I could say, sure, yeah, I have a connection. I've had other connections with Mother Mary, even though I'm not a Catholic or a Christian in any conventional sense. But that doesn't matter to me anymore. It's, it's something else. It's, there's like a third way that avoids the category of belief on either side, doesn't lose its skepticism, doesn't lose, it, lose its openness to experience, but not even just to experience. Like, oh, that just was a passing phenomenon, like a neural event. So what? that the experience has substance and encounters have, have a claim on reality. It's just, it's a different kind of reality than the one that you assent to the way that you sent to the laws of physics or mathematics or the existence of material objects in space time. So I've been kind of honing this vibe and this book was an opportunity to try to write that way. And, you know, it's not perfect. There are, there are some flaws. There's some, you know, kind of uh, an unkind reader will, w- would find certain parts that, that were vulnerable. But overall, I, did a, I think I did a pretty good job of trying to articulate a way of treating these extraordinary experiences, again, seriously, but not literally, and to do so in a way that respects ultimately respects the limitations of materialism in the philosophical scientific sense that we're talking about natural history. We're talking about objects in space time. We're talking about grounded human processes. We're not talking about other dimensions or other gods or some transcendental layer of reality or some unitive experience. Like I don't need to invoke any of that stuff to honor and open up the marvels, challenges, and transformative potentials of these kinds of experiences. And that was sort of my intellectual goal, was that I could imagine someone who was a materialist, who mostly thought of this stuff as bullshit, who, if they followed and were sympathetic to my arguments, would go, oh, I see, I got to take this stuff a little more seriously now. But again, not literally, not as a claim about the ultimate structure of reality. So. I had a lot going into like how I told the story and how I framed it as well as the story, the story itself. And yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun task. And we'll see how, how successful that is, you know, in terms of how people respond to it and, and whether they pick up some of those arguments and some of those ways of thinking. Cause I think it just gives us ways of thinking about these arcane, peculiar experiences and ideas and possibilities that don't lead to the normal way that people usually engage them, either this kind of snarky skepticism where you're dismissive and you're, you got that mean tone that so many like new atheists do, that kind of, <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> that, yeah. that attitude, which I find repulsive. Uh, and at the same time, there's so, much, there's so much believing now. You know, there's so many people who believe all these crazy conspiracy theories and they just, they're so unsubtle. It's not like the material isn't valuable. It may even be true in some sense, and maybe even large senses, but the way in which people fall into these kooky ideas, and I can say this as a longtime participant in the psychedelic underground, 
watching people become deluded, watching mythologies develop, watching language obscure more than it reveals, watching the way that people avoid critical thinking because it's uncomfortable, it's much more comfortable to believe in certain things or to just kind of not really try to think about the consequences of what you're experiencing. And, you know, I don't really respect that ultimately. I, were, I You know, I understand that it's necessary for a lot of people. Not everybody is a skeptical intellectual. Not everybody wants to hang with Robert Anton Wilson. But for me, it was important to kind of stand up for the validity of critical thinking in the midst of the weird. It's not about like, oh, the weird's over there. I'm going to stand on my critical thinking you know, little game board over here and talk about it at the distance. What I'm talking about is going into that stuff, is going into the weird, into the ambiguous, into the paranormal, into the, the absurd, and carrying with you a sort of, you know, a kit of, of critical thinking and skepticism and rationality as a way to kind of engage and understand more richly what this phenomena is like without getting caught in the usual traps. So there was a lot going on, but we'll see how much that comes through. You know, some of it's not implicit, some of it's just suggested, but there's a lot in there. It's a real multi-layered work. It definitely is. And I think it is important just to, to add on to that, that, you know, in this space that we occupy here, that we do find new ways to view these experiences or think about them or process them, because it's kind of dangerous to go all the way one direction or all the way the other. I do like your approach there that you tried to strike that balance, which I did think came through uh, rather well. So, And, you know, there's another phrase that you use in the book that ties into this, too, this phrase, religious experience. It's an interesting one. It's how PKD described his 2374 experience. But you call that term both troubled and troubling. Break that down for us. Why do you take issue with that term? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. I mean, part of it, again, as I mentioned before, is that I, I, I really came out of this or came into this project through the academic study of religious experience and this huge literature within which there's huge arguments about that because you have people, some of whom are like closet believers who aren't being necessarily always up front or they have some secret investment in some like supernatural claim or religious claim about reality and they're defending they want to defend religious experience as a viable way of understanding reality, not just going through some subjective flux of, of neurons or whatever, but actually having valid insights that can change and legitimate their embrace of religious lives, of new ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that rests on a very long tradition in American history and in the American thinking about religious experience, most obviously seen in the incredibly influential book by William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience. And so for James, he was like, here's sort of the background. So let's say it's the early, it's the early 19th century. And, you know, intellectuals, including theologians, people who are understanding, you know, deeply invested in the church are going, wow, this science stuff is, is no joke. The secular scientific, critical, materialist stuff is not going to go away. In fact, the more we look at the, the world, the more we find satisfying answers to what the world is that don't need God, that don't need the Bible. Oh, it turns out the Bible's wrong about the age of the earth. Oh, it turns out the Bible is wrong about the history of human civilization, et cetera, et cetera. This is happening in the 19th century. Then you lead to Darwin, and you're like, what are we, how we can't get back from that? So there's this sense that there's nowhere for religion to be because religion used to be everywhere. Religion was not a separate sphere. You were just in religion. The religion was in the field, the religion was in the church, the religion was in your getting born, religion was in your dying. It was just everywhere. And then gradually the world gets secularized or, or different explanations disenchant or take away that religious implication. So where is religion going to go? And one place for it to go is into experience, you know, into my personal subjective experience. So there's this shift, and it's very obvious in, in many different Western religions, but particularly in Protestantism, but not just that, it's in Judaism, it's in Catholicism, but there's this shift towards the centrality of experience, because in some ways, that's undeniable. You know, whatever you want to say about the age of the earth I had a sense of an encounter with a loving God that healed me of my suffering. 
that's pretty powerful stuff. So you see kind of like this development of a new idea, religious experience as a certain kind of experience that has this extra quality, this extra special quality to it. And that in many ways is what William James is writing about. He's not interested in dogmas. He's not interested in church institutions. He's not interested in histories or the training processes that people go through as they learn to pray this way, or they learn to do ritual that way and all that. There's so many different dimensions of what we mean by religion, but he really wanted just to focus on subjective experience and how it can be transformative, how it can be useful. And to some degree, although he was very sophisticated, it can be truthful. Um, Not the same truths as the physicist, but nonetheless, sort of a useful truth for human lives. So in a way, religious experience becomes a category that people, religious people can defend against the onslaught of secular, disenchanting, atheistic critique. But of course, those atheists and critics don't go away. And there's many of them inside the study of religion, which is a secular study. You know, I got a religious studies degree. It's not theology. Theology is, if you are a Christian, religious experiences, you can be secular. Most of us are, at least partly. You know, we, we turn to anthropology or psychology or history or politics as a way to understand religion as a phenomenon not as something that's necessarily truer than anything else. So within that world, there's a lot of people gunning for religious experience. They're going to shoot it down. They're going to show that the idea that there's any kind of experience that's different than any other kind of experience or there's any kind of special religious dimension is bullshit. And here's why. And some of them will turn to cognitive science and scientific ways of thinking about psychology and you know neurons and cognitive scripts and da-da-da. And others will turn towards more cultural ideas. And one of the main ones there is that when we have a religious experience, what we're kind of doing is sort of we're running on a script and our our life experience, our training in a religion, our, our exposure to popular culture sets up certain expectations uh, and we, you know, we know about this from advertising. This is definitely, you, know, you can you can set in motion through a set and setting, so to speak, uh, expectations that then when you have the peculiar eruption of a religious experience takes the form of a script or a story that's already kind of in the unconscious. And James also acknowledges that, that this is partly of what's, what's going on. But for some people, that explains the whole thing. That's the way you just deconstruct the whole thing. It's not about some insight into reality. It's like a weird kind of, you know, virtual reality that you invent or a dream that you invent on the time based on materials that have already come in your life or in your your general culture. So that's why it's a troubled and troubling term. And what I loved about writing about these guys is, again, because their experiences were kind of religious experiences and not religious experiences in other ways that I believe you can look at what they were doing and you can see the tensions and the complexity of these kinds of experiences in a way that is both true to these these critics to some extent, but also opening up to something that I believe there's an element of the beyond or the outside that's always, at least potentially, in our experience, that it's never a completely closed loop, that even bizarre, pathological, non-sacred encounters with high weirdness have within them the potential to have an encounter or a a meeting with the outside or the beyond to create something genuinely new, something that's not predictable, something that's not in the script, something that gestures or opens up the possibility of something radically different or radically new. And so I try to walk that line, stay on that edge of, of acknowledging the way in which our experience is in many ways scripted and constructed, that it, it's not a pure thing in itself the way it often seems to us. And in fact, if we're paying attention, it becomes clearer and clearer that that's the case. And at the same time, leaving the door open, leaving the space open, leaving the mind open, gesturing towards the open, away from the closed, towards possibility, the unknown, what Lovecraft called the outside, the great outdoors, the cosmos, and that leaving that door open in my theory, you know, my, my ways of thinking, as well as in my heart or my aesthetic reactions, to me is just like a, 
that's just, I'm just committed to that as a way of being in the world. You know, I'm, that's not going to change. Even if you show me that some idea is actually not as novel as it looks, or it comes from this, or you can trace it back to there. I'm like, great, but I'm not going to stop doing that because I think that's a, that's just sort of an ethic. It's like a fundamental value in my life. And it's something that I share with William James in many ways. William James is a very critical philosophical person willing to deconstruct human psychology and talk about it in, in pretty, you know, process oriented terms, not making big claims about gods or the ultimate nature of reality or anything like that. But he was, he was rigorous, open-minded and to some people foolishly. So in, in some, in some cases, but not in my book, to my mind, you don't, you don't walk this line that I'm talking about better than William James did. And so I follow him on some of the ways that he thinks about things, the way he, th he thought about psychedelic experiences, the way he thought about extraordinary experiences, the way he thought about the paranormal, and the way he thought about the fact that, in his words, we are, we are living in a pluralistic universe, or a, a pluriverse rather than a universe. We don't live the world, the place we actually are is not one thing. It cannot be explained with one thing, with one kind of discourse with one plane of where the ultimate truth lies, whether that's the level of, you know, quarks blipping in and out of existence in some kind of quantum vacuum, or whether it's on the level of like DNA and the sort of physical manifestation of these fleshy bodies that are stuck in history, or whether it's social systems, this idea that, you know, society constructs us and the social constructionism that we're just invented by institutions and histories and all of our thoughts and all of our experiences are kind of, all of those things are, are partial truths because we live in a pluriverse. We live in a pluralistic universe. And that pluralism allows for contradictory things to exist side by side. And that's another thing that I'm really committed to in this book is showing that once you adopt a certain kind of pluralism, a lot of things make a lot of sense because you don't have to try to reduce everything to one plane of the real or one plane of truth. And it's not relativism. That's another kind of thing, but that's opening another, uh, another can of worms. At least that's partly what James is trying to do is say, no, this isn't just like postmodern relativism where anything goes. That's not what I'm talking about, but that's another kind of whole other conversation. Yeah, it is. And uh, the pluriverse that you're describing there, it's inherently fucking weird too, if you think about it. So I want to circle back to the idea of the script that you were talking about just real quick, because I was curious, you know, how sure are you, Eric, that that script is written prior to these experiences? Is it possible that they're written during or even after them? Yeah, there is some temporal, what do you want to call it, sort of hiccups that are implied in the stuff. And I didn't go too far into that in general, partly because I, because of my scientific respect and kind of framework in some ways that I have a lot of respect for the idea of like temporal cause unfolding in a in a more or less linear way. I think there are resonances through time and that's kind of interesting, but I tend to think in that, you know, one thing leading to another kind of framework. So I tend to emphasize the notion that it also accords with more materialist ways of thinking about human experience and in many ways what I was trying to do again in this book is to kind of more or less agree with the overall approach of a materialist and then twist it or weird it. And so if you, if you come off right off the bat and say, well, actually, maybe these experiences are scripting themselves from the future, they're going to be like, shut up. Like, they're not even going to give you time of day. So in some ways, I, I weighted it in the, for a number of reasons in this, this kind of direction. That said, you can't, especially looking at Philip K. Dick, there are these weird kind of echoes that go sort of both directions. And sometimes or often they seem to point to there's something that happens and then he, he writes the script and then later on it appears in his experience. So he writes The Man in the High Castle where the character Tagomi is looking at a, you know, a, a necklace, a, little, a piece of jewelry, and the light is shining on it and the light hits his eyes and he has this kind of transcendental moment that briefly opens up another dimension of reality another parallel universe. Uh, so you have that whole experience. And then later on, when you read Dick's writing about 2374 and the encounter with the delivery woman and her necklace, you're like, oh, that's, that's sort of familiar now, isn't it? 
Uh, you yeah. know, and so from a, you know, kind of a parsimonious point of view, you go, yeah, he set, he sort of wrote his script, forgot about it, like some Austin Osman spare sigil. And then it reemerges within the fabric of his experience, or at least the way in which he narrates that experience after the fact. And that's something that's very evident with, with Phil Dick in particular, is you can see the way that he begins to tell a story and then he changes that story over time, sometimes quite significantly. And he does this all the time. So you can never get to like the record of what actually happened to him. Even if you acknowledge that there, we're always telling a story about the experience we have, even when you acknowledge that, he's still changing the story all the time. So for him, when he saw those resonances, what he thought was like, oh, my earlier writing was actually prophetic. My earlier writing was glimpsing the future where this cosmic sacred reality would become apparent. Now, again, from a parsimonious point of view, from a kind of Occam's razor point of view, it's pretty clear which one would make more sense. But Occam's razor only gets you so far in this realm we're in. At a certain point, it doesn't do it anymore. At a certain point, it gets in the way. And so I'm, I'm open to the idea that, especially once you get writing involved, once there's literal texts, and texts are kind of talking to each other through and across time in weird ways, that that temporal shift or slipstream that's opened up with textuality to some degree may also tell us something about how these experiences hop, skip, and jump through time, which is also you know a way of talking about synchronicity because synchronicity is a lot about time. And in many ways, synchronicities can be described as a kind of writing in experience. But they often take the form of like a, a joke or like a hieroglyph, like two things come together that they don't look that, so, oh, wait, no, they are totally similar. And in fact, they're referring to some other story or some other implication, often thoughts or ideas or words, but then they're manifesting in physical reality. And clearly, synchronicities happen. Clearly, people who take psychedelics in particular have an uptick in experiences, whatever those things are. And I don't offer a theory of them in the book. I more try to show how they work, how people make meaning from them. But I think that they, that synchronous, when you ask about scripts that move through time in different ways, I think it's related to how synchronicities write themselves or we perceive them as being written. And I can, with stuff like that, I can, I, my tendency is to go to the lip of the enigma and then stop and stare and see what comes up rather than go farther and begin to crystallize a kind of speculative metaphysical picture that is radically different than a more skeptical, grounded kind of point of view. So that can be frustrating to some readers. But for me, that's the way to approach some of these possibilities, which I still acknowledge. I mean, in my own life, I've, I've had weird synchronicities and things with, with texts and writing and you know, a sense that I maybe did I dream this or I already, oh, maybe I was dreaming the future or I'm now I'm reliving a dream. And, you know, I have a sense of the kinds of experiences that force people to go, well, it's not just all scripted. And also, even just from the point of view, without even talking about weird temporality, that gets back to this point where I'm saying it's never just all scripted. Or, I mean, I guess it is in some cases, but it's, it's not for all cases that there's still something like the outside or the beyond or the great outdoors. And I use multiple terms because I'm not saying I know what it is. And in fact, if you congeal what that is, and it might be transtemporal, it might be a point of radical novel novelty. It might be a point where, you know, uh, the, the sort of possibilities of, of quantum reality congeal in different ways, according to, you know, some sort of meta selection process that we don't understand. Those are all cool ideas. But my preference is to just kind of gesture towards them out the outside, the beyond, and say that whatever that is, is still playing a role in these kinds of experiences. Yeah. And again, a, a well-balanced approach there that I can respect and appreciate. And Eric, we have about a half hour or so left of our time here. And I'd like to transition into some bonus content now for our Patreon audience. But before we do that, tell our free audience where they can find the book and keep up with your work if they're interested. Sure, sure. So uh, the book, again, is High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. 
buy it from a bookstore. It's also a very lovely book, well illustrated. We worked really hard on making it pretty, and the cover was worked out really well. I'm very happy with the artist and the whole vision of it. So it, it's an unusually nice object. I, I wanted to make something that felt weird, and I think that that was successful. So that's out there. And if you want to track me, you can just go go to my website, technosis.com, T-E-C-H. GNOSIS.com. Sign up for the the occasional mailing list. Way to keep up with me. Um, I've been doing the podcast Expanding Mind for uh, for basically a decade. I'm going to take a break this summer, step back, think about what I want to do in the podcast realm. So much stuff has changed, and so many people are doing really cool shows that are more in the zone that my show has been in. That I feel I can step back for a little bit and kind of see how it's going. But there's tons of shows there, and you can keep up with me. And there's events, pages, and tons of writing. If you like the kind of writing you get in High Weirdness, you could read for weeks on uh, Technosis. Absolutely. I'll link to all that in the show notes for sure. So thanks so much for taking the time. I know you're busy out promoting this thing. So it means a lot to me that you were here to have this chat. So Yeah, it was a great conversation. I really appreciate your, uh, your questions and, uh, and I like your show. And there you have it. My thanks again to Eric Davis for bringing all the weirdness that we could fit into that episode. And there was more of it in the Patreon extension where we talked about Eric's idea of weird naturalism, Terrence and Dennis McKenna's experiment at La Chorrera, Robert Anton Wilson's idea of Chapel Perilous, verisimilitude, and the idea of a hoax. It's my personal favorite topic there from the show. We also chatted about the exegesis of Philip K. Dick as a piece of weird fiction, and Eric's thoughts on The Owl in Daylight, a PKD's unrealized novel. And my thanks to new patrons who hopefully enjoyed that extension. Runa, Joseph, Harmless Weirdo, Ted, Ghost Bride, Aaron, Jack, and Kerr. Much appreciated, guys. Thanks for hopping on board. And speaking of Patreon, I posted something on there a couple weeks ago that I'd like to share with the wider listening audience here. Those of you on Patreon have probably seen this or heard this by now. But if you haven't, it will be news uh, to you as well. Now, if you subscribe to the show, you have no doubt noticed that the cadence of shows have slowed down this year. And there is a reason for that. I'll spare you all the personal details. But basically, my personal life and my personal interests have been gradually shifting. And most of this year, that shift has forced me to re-examine what I'm here to do and why I'm here to do it. So I made the decision recently to actually go back to school uh, in a way, a very, very small way, I guess. Some of you may know from listening to the show that I've taken up quite the interest in health, wellness, nutrition, and similar subjects. And to be honest, it's become my primary interest and passion. And it's gone far beyond something like, you know, just like changing dietary habits. It's been a couple years worth of, of study and research and self-experimentation and picking the brain of uh, my primary care physician, who's a, a licensed naturopath. I looked into some full undergrad programs and some postgrad programs at various places and after some research decided actually not to pursue another degree. I'm not going into that much debt again, be it with my time or money, but mostly the time because, you know, I only have so much of that as it is. During my research, though, I did find something that suited my needs. And as of a couple of weeks ago, I'm enrolled as an online student at Cornell University studying nutrition and healthy living. And it's just a short six-month course. And after that six months, I'll have a certificate, uh, fingers crossed, obviously, from Cornell's Division of Nutritional Sciences. Uh, It's not a a full bachelor's or master's, obviously, but it's not something to sneeze at either. And I think at the least, it provides me a legitimate academic background, I guess, in that field and opens up, you know, some potential avenues for a career change, which is something I desperately want and need because, you know, fuck day jobs and marketing and advertising, you know. As for what that means for this podcast, I've had to rethink that too. Uh, My coursework starts at the end of August and I have interviews booked uh, most every week through mid-August. So the the content is still coming uh, in the short term. In the long term, I have another podcast project actually that I want to pursue that has, uh, at least on paper, reinvigorated my creative energy and aligns better with who I am now and and what I'm interested in. Now granted, podcasts in any genre these days are a dime a dozen, but there's something missing from the health and wellness space, which, you know, as you might suspect, is 
a space that's rife with you know politics and corruption and a whole lot of fuckery, as I like to say. And I kind of want to explore that, but I want to explore that in a, a different way than most podcasts explore subject matter these days, which is just back and forth conversational things or straight Q&A, kind of like we do on the show here. At the same time, I want to continue to learn and grow and, and share that journey with you because that is important to me. But I also want to employ, you know, like a more traditional journalistic approach. I, I have a traditional journalistic background. And I want to pair that, you know, with the weirdness to stay in the theme of this episode here with Eric. I want to explore some of the, you know, holistic and alternative methodologies that I've become privy to. And I want to provide, you know, science behind them. And I want to tell and share stories from that space. And not just the same old stories, you know, but like original investigative enterprise stories with, you know, just a a twist of bizarreness. Because, you know, those kinds of stories have always been my jam. So I guess that's just a small taste of what I've been up to and what I'll be up to in the future. And much more information on all that is coming at a later date for sure. So until then, though, you know, let's just keep this train rolling here. You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh,